Hello Sunday School and welcome to another preview lesson of our upcoming Lifeway Bible Studies for Life quarterly lesson. Today we're going to be looking at uh, the final the final lesson in this quarter for the summer uh, discussing Asa and his legacy upon his son King Jehoshaphat. So if you have your Bibles please get ready and turn to 2nd Chronicles chapter 17 uh, so we can preview this lesson and I'm going to try my best not to take 30 minutes to review this lesson. I say that every time and every time I look at the video it's longer and longer. Matter of fact I'm making the video long right now just by doing all this talking. So thank you for joining and uh, being with, with me today and pray that these previews have been a blessing to you and your classes as you prepare to go in to teach these lessons, or if by chance you missed Sunday school and you still wanted to get a overview of the word. So with that being said, let us jump into 2 Chronicles chapter 17 as we study a new king by the name of Asa. Our Sunday school lesson entitles this, Leave a Legacy, uh, with the point, Godly Living Impacts Future ge Generations. So leave a legacy and godly generations I messed that up. Godly living impacts future generations. So as you know, for the past four or five weeks, we've been looking at uh, one of my favorite characters of the Bible, King Asa, and his life lived out of Second Chronicles chapter 14, 15, and 16. And we study how he had some great times with the Lord and how he had some low times with the Lord, how he had some hot times with the Lord and how he had some not so good times with the Lord. Now we come to 2 Chronicles chapter 17 after Asa has died and his son now uh, become king. So I just want to pull out a few principles uh, that God laid up on my heart as I was reading these passages, as I was reading this passage uh, that, that maybe impact you and just give you a different view uh, or some different morsels of information uh, for you to chew on as you prepare for this Sunday morning. So we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 17. To save time, I'm not going to read the entire passage at the beginning. I'll just read it as we go through it. Uh, and my thought, what I came to title this lesson was or is, be careful on what you leave behind. Be careful on what you leave behind. My wife and I, we love we love to watch HGTV and one of the shows on there or many of the shows on there that we watch, we like, but one show in particular is called House Hunters, uh, House Hunter Renovation. And it, it takes a couple through choosing a home that they want to live in and uh, the realtor would take them from home to home uh, to, to see which house they would want to live in. Does it meet their needs? And, and it, it always entertains me how the husband and the wife, they have different tastes of what they're looking for in a house. Uh, and, and when they go into a house though, that needs a lot of work, that, that, that the carpet is stained or the walls are mildewed or, or, or the kitchen is old, you can see the expression upon their face and they say, this needs a lot of work. And that's because the previous tenants or the previous owners, they left behind a house in not livable conditions. So the couple, they have to make a choice. Do they want to move into this house and, and renovate it, tear down everything, gut it out and repaint it, put down new carpet? Or do they want to find a house that the previous owners or the current owners has done such a great job on? All they have to do is move in and build upon what they already have. And the reason why I bring it up as an illustration is because we need to be careful on what we leave behind because someone is always coming after us. Whether it's in our families as, as, as parents, our children are coming after us. Whether it's in our leadership roles and our jobs or in leadership roles in our churches or in ministry that we do in ministry. No matter what we're doing, someone was doing it before us and someone is going to do it after us. And the question is, are we leaving it in a better condition than when we found it or is it worse than when we found it? And when Jehoshaphat now comes into being the king of Israel, the king of Judah, he finds that his father left it in good condition. It's turnkey. That's a really to turn, meaning that you could just move in and it's all good. Jehoshaphat came into ruling the kingdom. It says in verse 1 that Asa's son Jehoshaphat became king in his place and made his position 
over Israel firm. The word Israel here is referring to the southern kingdom, uh, also known as Judah. Jehoshaphat came in following his father, and though his father had made some mistakes, his father had made some great strides on getting the kingdom aligned with God's word and living for God and doing what God had said. He had set up some revival periods where the people had committed themselves to God. He had torn down the idol worship temples, the idol worship uh, sacrifice places. King Asa did this so when he died his son came along and his son was able to build upon what his father had already done and the question again I, I ask is are we leaving behind the position or the place in which God has allowed us to occupy are we leaving it in such a way that the people that are following us can build upon what we have done or they happen to come in to tear down what we had done because it was not about God. It was not for God. It was, it was centered on the flesh. It was centered on, on man and not centered on God. But though Asa in chapter 16, we saw one of his falls. We, we, we see that he had a son that was serious uh, about building upon what his father had done. And matter of fact, the Bible the Bible goes on, it says in verse 2 that Jehoshaphat placed troops in all the cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had captured. And if you remember in, 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 in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 and in chapter 16, his father Asa... <clears throat> had extended the kingdom and captured some cities. So now that Jehoshaphat is on the scene, he's strengthening and building up what his father had left behind. And this is a good word for those of us who are living in the shadows and the legacy of, of people that have gone before us. How are we strengthening that which they have left in our stewardship? How are we taking care of that which they have left us with? Are we messing it up? Are we tearing it down? Or are we not being good stewards of it? Or are we building upon that which the people before us has left behind. It, it reminds me of the fact that, that my mother was a graduate of high school, but her father was not a graduate of high school. His father was not a graduate even out of, out of middle school, and his father was a slave. So it goes back that, that, that each generation built upon the education and took it a little bit farther. My great Great grandfather who was a slave had a son who made it through sixth grade education, who had a who had a son who made it through high school, who had a daughter, my mother, who made it through high school and, and a little bit of college, who had a son who now is multi-degree, who is now multi-degree, and I have daughters who better get some degrees too, but we're building upon that which was left behind. And from a spiritual context. Jehoshaphat made it a, a, a priority of his reign to not mess up what his father had done, but to build upon the legacy his father had left. Conversely, you remember that Asa had to clean up his father's mess. But what a blessing it is that Asa, instead of leaving a mess behind, he left a turnkey situation for Jehoshaphat to come into the kingdom and be able to say, I can build on this thing. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, it's incumbent upon us to not only build upon the spiritual legacy of people that have come before us, but also to continue to build upon it so that those who are coming after us can build as well. Let every round go higher and higher. So the question we have to ask is, what foundation are we laying for those who are coming after us? What spiritual foundation are we laying for our children? What spiritual foundation are we laying for those who look at us? One of the, the most blessed stories I heard just happened um, a, a few weeks ago. I, at our church, we have 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. And I normally go to 11 a.m., but for this particular day, I went to 8 a.m., and on Sundays, I, in every day, but particularly on Sundays, I would always go to a particular part of our house and I would read my Bible, drink my coffee and have a time of prayer, praying for different ministry, different pastors, uh, and everything to go well at the church that I attend. 
And 90% of the time, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Joy, she would come and join me in the room and she would sit down with me. She's only four years old, but she would go grab her Bible that she has and she would sit, in the, sit on the couch with me and she would begin to read. And when I kneel down to pray, she would pray with me and, and I would pray with her. Well, my wife told me the other day that Sunday morning, she got out the bed and she was getting ready to get the children ready, but one of the children was missing out of the bedroom. So she walked over to the other place where we normally have prayer. And there my daughter was fully dressed in her Sunday best, had her Bible in her lap, and she was talking to God and praying. And my daughter and my wife said, Joy, why are you over here? Why are you over here reading your Bible? She said, this is where daddy and I come to study and learn about God and to talk to God. Bless my heart. That's a legacy. Now, I don't pray so that my daughters can see me praying. I don't study the word so that my daughters can see me studying the word. I do this to honor God. I do this because I love God and I love his word. But in doing that, my daughters see it and they're already imitating it at the ages of four and six years old. What spiritual legacy are we leaving behind? Are we leaving behind a legacy of how to mistreat others or get caught up in materialism or get caught up in worldly living? Are we leaving a legacy behind to be about me, myself, or I? Or we leave, or are we leaving a legacy that honors God and put God first, that loves God and love his people? Be careful. Be careful on, on what you leave behind. Another thing it says in verse three is that the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father as David early, earlier days and did not seek the Baals. Verse four says he sought the God of his father, followed his commandments and did not act as Israel or the Northern kingdom did. So the Lord established the kingdom in his control and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. He took pride in the ways of the Lord and again removed the high places and the Asherim from Judah. A couple of things I want to point out for you as you study this text. It says that God was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father David earlier days. Now understand that David is his great, great, great grandfather. So he, he uh, so Jehoshaphat didn't have any videos of how David lived. He didn't have any pictures of David, but what he had was a chronicle. He had a word that had been written down about David and how God honored David and how David was a man after God's own heart and how God had made a covenant with David. Jehoshaphat knew his history. Jehoshaphat knew his history. Jehoshaphat knew his spiritual history and he picked David to emulate his life afterwards. And my brother and sisters in Christ, this is a good lesson for all of us to learn that we should have some spiritual people that were emulating our life afterwards. Jehoshaphat heard about David. He had studied about David. And yes, it was somebody that was in his lineage, but he had studied about him and had heard about him. He said, that's somebody I want to live like. And the Bible says he, 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 he repeated the acts of David's earlier days, meaning the days when David was a shepherd boy spending time with God in the field, the days when God, when David had became king and he worshiped him and almost came out of his clothes, the days when David went up against Goliath all by himself with a slingshot and five smooth stones. Uh, this is the David that he studied, the David that was walking with God, the David who in Saul was is chasing him. He chose not to kill Saul because he said, do not touch the anointed of God and do his prophets no harm. He studied the time of David when the nation had came to him, even though he wasn't the official king yet, but they saw the anointing on his life. He studied the life of David and how he was gracious towards Abigail, even though she was married to a foolish man named Nabal. He studied the life of David and saw how he brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple again. He studied the life of David and saw how he had a life that was seeking to please God. And he said, that's the life I want to emulate. Now, we all know that David had some issues, that David had some things that he did. He stepped wayward with, but, but, but Jehoshaphat chose the, the things that David did that were righteous and honoring to God to emulate. So my question for you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as my question, I would ask my class, who in the Bible are you emulating? 
Who in the Bible and, and, and life are you emulating? If you were to ask me that question, I would tell you, I try to be like Job with my family because Job in chapter one, it says that he prayed for his children and made sacrifice for his children every single day, just in case they may have messed up. So I try to be like Job with my family. I try to be like Joseph on my job and walk with integrity and do what I'm told to do. I try to be like uh, uh, Daniel on my job when everybody else is being worldly. I, I, I'm trying to live and in, 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 in worship God in the midst of a corrupt uh, society and world. I, I try to emulate David in my worship and I try to emulate Jesus in everything I do. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, Jehoshaphat was emulating David. Who are you emulating from the biblical text in your life today? We've given so many other people to be like, you can be like Mike or you can be like Ike, uh, uh, Eisenhower, not Turner. Some of y'all will get that later. But some of us, some of us need to be sure that we're walking after those individuals who have lived a godly life. And it is, I, I might not get to, I might not get to all this. You know what? I might not, I might not get to everything that I, I wrote down, but, but uh, one of the, one of the things I want to, I, I want to bring up here is that Jehoshaphat's present living was influenced by past godliness. And a lot of times we as believers, a lot of times churches are looking for something new, the new way of worship, the, the new way of seeking God or, or, or the new way to attract the crowds or the new way to teach. You know what? The best thing to do is to do it how the word of God says it. And the, what the word says is not old, it's not ancient, it's eternal. If it worked a thousand years ago because God said it, guess what? It still will work today when we're guided by his spirit. And sometimes we can get so caught up in the fads of worship and in the fads of dress and in the fads of preaching styles and teaching styles that we just forget to get caught up in what the word of God says. Jehoshaphat wasn't trying to do anything new. He was trying to be like somebody in the past. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, there's nothing wrong with being like Jesus. <laughs> he, he lived, he walked this earth 2,000 years ago, but everything he did is still good for today. So let us not try to get caught up in trying to create something new or be something fresh or be, uh, be, be a disruptor in the church. Let us get caught up in doing what the word of God says and emulating the men and women of the Bible who trusted God and walked with God. You know what? I'm going to wrap this thing up. One more thing I want to point out because I'm going to make this a short, short video. I'm going to make it a short video. God blessed him because he was walking with God. I got two more things I'm going to point out. It says in verse six, he took great pride in the ways of the Lord. Yes, God had blessed him materially, had prospered Jehoshaphat, had given him life. He was a king's son, so he had already had nepotism, so he already was rich. But now God is making him rich on top of rich. God is just blessing him, overflowing him, uh, giving him everything that he needs, and then some. But Jehoshaphat did not get caught up in the blessing, but he stayed caught up in the blesser. And that is important, y'all, because it's so easy in this day and age to get caught up in the materialism, to get caught up in the blessings that God has given us. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us not get caught up in the creation, but let us get caught up in the creator. Let us get caught up in the blessings, but let us stay wrapped up and caught up and tied up with the blesser. And that's God. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. In spite of all the material things that God had given him to be a steward over, he didn't begin to counted. He didn't begin to say, look at me, look at what I got. But the Bible says he took pride in the ways of the Lord. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalms 112, where it says, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord and delights in his commandments. This is who Jehoshaphat was. He feared God and he, he, he delighted in his commandments. Proverbs 26, 19, somewhere in there, it says, God says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. God is not for us to be caught up in his blessings. He wants us to be caught up in him as the blesser. I'm going to wrap this up. My last point. I got so much more I want to say, but I'm looking at my time and I'm already spent. The last thing I want to just bring out is how Jehoshaphat led the rest of the nation in verses 7 through 9 
to get in the word. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, the importance of being in God's word. You know, Jehoshaphat didn't lead them on how to get rich or how to be healthy or how to be slayed in the spirit. I know that's some new vernacular. He said, y'all need to learn the word. He had a father that was serious about the word of God. He saw his father being serious about the word and he saw the difference the word of God made in his father's life. Jehoshaphat said, I see the difference that God's word is making in my life. Y'all, everybody else need to get in the word. So he sent out the crew to teach the word. He didn't, he didn't go out and teach them about himself and all his exploits and all that he had done. He didn't have his big old picture uh, uh, set up for everybody to know who he was. He said, I want you to know who God is. Come on, y'all. Let's get back to the word. That's why I love the church that I go to right now that, I, that I'm at and have been for a long time because we're about that word. And as a matter of fact, God has blessed me over the many years of ministry I've been in. Every single church that I've been a part of has been serious about his word. What does God say? Not as what a curriculum say, not as what the, the most popular preacher is saying. What does God say? And the only way you can know what God is saying is when you sit down and you listen to his word. I got some more notes that I want to I wanna go over. But I ain't, I'm not going to take up more of your time. But I do want to challenge you as my brothers and sisters in Christ to leave a legacy that is about God. Paul said, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians, he said, there's no other foundation that can be left except that of Jesus Christ. You can build on it, whatever you want to build on it, but don't forget that foundation is uh, Jesus Christ. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it now. I don't, um, I can't, I can't find it, but there's a there, there's a passage of scripture that says, so look it up. It talks about the foundation that already been foundation that have already been laid. And when it comes to Jesus Christ, he is the foundation. The question is, what are we building on that foundation? And when others come behind us, do they got to tear down the mess that we made just to get back to Christ? But everything that we build should be Jesus Christ and nothing less. Jesus Christ and nothing less. Jesus Christ and nothing less. And when our sons, our daughters, next generations come after us, they can be a little bit further ahead because of what we built before them. God, we thank you for your word and for this series of lessons about Asa and his son Jehoshaphat and for the reminder you have for all of us to make you priority in all that we do. For when we make you our business, you make us your business and you bless us accordingly. Help us all to seek you first, knowing that everything else will be added unto us. We love you. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, Sunday School. Use the rest of this time wisely. It's not 30 minutes. It's only like 25. Be blessed.